श्रीनिवासन क्या मैं ऑडिबल यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल सर गुड मॉर्निंग टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट इन दिस सेशन सो वेलकम बैक टू द थर्ड डे सेशन ऑफ दिस एफडीपी ऑन आईओटी सो दिस इज सेशन नंबर 7 Uh, we are focusing on something called AI AOT using web-based programming. So this, uh, the agenda for this session is uh, basically we will try to understand about uh, what a smart IoT system contains and how our machine learning concepts are going to be uh, can be deployed or can be incorporated onto your IoT system. and of course uh, how the ml for iot is going to be useful and the programming tools such as tensorflow.js is going to be uh, discussed a little bit with practice and followed by uh, a demo on running machine learning models directly in the uh, browser of your system using tensorflow.js so i hope you have received this mail of course uh, uh, i have just sent before the start of this session so this uh, ppt slides will be available to you this session number 7 and uh, i hope you also received the uh, yesterday's sessions uh, ppt so anyway at the end of the program all the slides materials will be uh, kept at one repository and we'll be sharing to you along with the video links which will be uh, once they are uploaded onto the youtube we'll provide the links to you all so that uh, as a bundle as a package we'll try to disseminate this information to you all even those who are just simply attending also you can uh, grab those materials for your reference purpose so let us come to the session uh, of course if you have any uh, doubts we can discuss during this particular day of course you will be seeing my face all the day most except work for one session so let us go ahead so just i'm thinking seeing that at least uh, some more few people will be joining the session that's why i'm simply dragging this right so what a smart iot system comprises what are the basic components uh, an iot system will have so for for the last two days you might have at least uh, uh, had an idea about the internet of things uh, as a system Uh, basically it contains various uh, electronics and uh, the electronic systems are been instrumented and they are been interconnected with various communication media and of course you are trying to uh, collect the information from this uh, ambient or from any system or from an entity and you try to process the data and get some inferences from the processed data so basically if you look into the uh, smart iot system and it says smart Uh, when the smart word is added to the iot system it means the iot system is having certain kind of intelligence so without a smart or without an intelligent iot system is basically an automation system so but we are trying to add a prefix to that is basically a, to emphasize on the uh, involvement of the intelligence process that is involved with the iot system itself so the iot system basically consists of your mechanical and electrical parts of course this basically they there you see in terms of sensors actuators various other electronic components gadgets which are trying to interact with themselves in the sense that machine to machine interaction will be there and of course they are also interacting with the environment and as well as with the various other physical entities and trying to uh, collect some information based on their usage and try to provide certain information to us so that we can make some apt decisions so along with this uh, sensors also we have certain computational devices uh, the processing units we call it as in terms of processors microcontrollers and so on and so forth and of course that collected data from these sensors also is going to be stored what are the information or the data that is been collected is going to be stored at a particular place and we try to use that stored data for a, an appropriate purpose for our different set of applications so along with this uh, the mechanical and electronics or the electrical parts we also have the communication system so that uh, those sensors the mechanical devices and the electrical parts are going to be interconnected with each other and they are going to have certain kind of communications 
Of course, you have antennas for the wireless communications. And also we follow certain protocols, the rules in the form of uh, certain uh, standards. We try to incorporate on the data exchange between those set of systems. And as well as we try to have certain kind of computational devices on which we call it as an onboard analytics who have certain kind of intelligence to be incorporated onto those IoT systems. So those onboard analytics is basically to have certain systems to be trained based on the IoT data that is being collected. And once the system gets trained, it starts to make certain app decisions. Once you try to give certain kind of conditions or once you are expecting certain kind of predictions based on those certain artificial intelligence models, we try to do it uh, by incorporating those methodologies. That's why this system is basically been termed as a, a smart IoT system. So if you look to the what is an IoT data, so the data that is coming from the sensors, once they, it has been collected from the sensor and it has been passed on to your processing units, the IoT data will be having certain kind of uh, uh, information which looks like something which has been shown on the slide for you. So basically it is a metadata, a data about data, a metadata which concerns uh, from where the device, from which particular device that sensing data is being collected and what is the type of the data and of course what is that particular uh, data which has been put together in the form of a model and what is the other details such as the uh, electronic gadgets data of manufacture hardware serial number and so on and so forth so that metadata is going to have a certain structure that is a certain form that form is basically uh, if, if you look into the computer science and it field in the programming perspective. So that form is basically called as key value or a attribute value. So attribute is a property or a characteristic. So device ID, it can be called as a key, it can be called as an attribute. And that particular corresponding to that key, K-E-Y, key, you have a corresponding value that indicates what is that person, a device ID is. Similarly, the location is basically the location here is the key and the corresponding value is floor. And of course the room, room is the particular key or the attribute and the corresponding number or the value of that is 128. And at that particular room, what is the temperature? So temperature is the key or you can call it as an attribute and what is the corresponding value? So those key and attributes are separated by a colon symbol. So we call it as a key value pair. So the form in which the machine to machine interaction or a device to device or for efficient processing of the data if the data has been properly structured and the data has been properly passed from one entity to another entity. So that particular processing will be very efficient and it can be done in real time and a lot of redundancies can be avoided. So as of now, this particular structure is basically called as a JSON structure. So JavaScript object a navigator, or you can call it as a, a notation. So this is basically a key value pair, pair a pair contains uh, two set of things. One is your key, another is a value. So the key value pairs will be a collection of so many key value pairs, which are pertaining to various devices that are being sensed from the environment. So this is a metadata. This is one particular form. That's what just I like to show you here. Similarly, this IoT data also has got certain other information such as state information. The state information is basically describes about the current state of the device and it's not of the environment, please remember. The context, the state, or in other words, it implies the context, the context in which the particular uh, device is working or in the device is functional, which describes the current state of the device. So this information can be a, a read or a write operations too. And also you have certain informations like telemetry. This is a read only data about the environment. So you just, you get the information from the environment that you usually collected through sensors. And each source of the telemetry results is a channel. It means you once you collect the information about the environment, about the channel in which it is working, in which it particular context, or in which particular frequency, and in which particular uh, data transmissions it is working. And that data is going to be stored in a stateful variable on the device or on the cloud. It can be either on the edge or the fork, or it can be on the cloud. And of course, the IoT data also has got certain commands. So when the machine to machine interaction takes place, those commands are going to be executed. Those commands are going to be generated from one machine to machine, and they are going to be executed at different instances of 
time and year for different applications. And you also have certain informations called operational informations. So data such as computers operating with certain temperatures falls down to certain category or certain threshold level. So it becomes relevant as one has to respond to breakages and to correct perform integrations or a soft software updates. So these are the different set of informations that you need to look for. Now coming to, once you collect the data from the sensors, which are pertaining to the IoT system. So the data analysis parts comes into picture and the data analysis is basically, yesterday we have seen a small, a brief introduction about the machine learning. So just let me reiterate, machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. In other words, so once you collect the sensors data from the IoT system, the sensors data itself should improve your algorithm or your model that is being run continuously on a particular application. So automatically the algorithms will be adaptable based on the data that is getting from the various sensors of the IoT systems and it keeps on updating itself to the new sets of data that is getting from the outside world. So obviously then that particular process, basically we call it as a machine learning and that machine learning is going to be very much useful for incorporating or running the IoT systems very fruitfully. So if you look into the machine learning aspects, the concepts behind the machine learning. So basically just to uh, make an idea for the beginner, uh, those who are not having that much idea on data analysis or the AI process. So this particular session, of course, I'm not going to dwell into the depth of this particular machine learning. And the yeah. nevertheless, we'll try to understand the framework, the basic steps which are being incorporated on the machine learning or the data analysis part especially with respect to the IoT data. So to just to recap and give some brief idea about machine learning, machine learning can be done uh, basically uh, in two different ways. One is unsupervised learning, the other is supervised learning. We also have uh, other semi-supervised learning and other sets of uh, learnings too, but basically to understand, to start with, uh, people try to understand uh, with respect to the two main uh, learning processes, one is unsupervised and the supervised. So the names of the methods which falls under these two basic categories is basically you can, you might have seen in some papers or some at some point or the later, something called as clustering, classifications, regressions, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, this is all basically you might have understood on the data mining concepts too. Nevertheless, the overlapping is there on the data mining and the machine learning aspects as far as the uh, data analysis is concerned here. So when you let us uh, a little bit go into the uh, some more in depth about what is supervised learning. So basically majority of the practical machine learning approaches uses this supervised learning. So what is this supervised supervision? Supervision means already a known information is there. So based on that known information, you are going to infer uh, this particular uh, new sets of inputs to be of what particular uh, category or what particular classification is all about. So this is in, in other simple terms, uh, the supervised learning is a kind of a learning process which contains the basic applications such as regressions, classifications, and so on and so forth. So if you see uh, the regression function in math, uh, if you look into the mathematical equation form, f of x is equal to y, where y is a real number. It means basically the value of x is mapped on, on applying the functionalities onto the x. Obviously you're going to get a corresponding y value. And of course, uh, the classification of f of x is equal to y, which is also implies that if you're doing a classification process or a classification problem to be solved, so y is basically a categorical label, which is belonging to a particular uh, set of x values. So this is basically in uh, simple mathematics. In the school days, we all have studied y is equal to mx plus c, a basic simple regression equation, where there is a relation between your x and y. So now how this supervised learning is happening or is going to take place in the basic system? Of course, it can be uh, the system means it may not be a laptop or it may not be a workstation, it may not be a, a server or it may not be on the cloud. It can be on your Raspberry Pi or it can be on your uh, uh, microcontroller device or any, any embedded systems too. You can incorporate the same process. Of course, there is with respect to the data uh, processing and this, some, some of their limitations do exist on the quantity of data that you are getting uh, processed. Now to perform the supervised learning, 
usually you take a training data set in the sense that you perform training your machine is getting learned by itself by taking certain positive and negative examples in the sense that uh, already you, the known examples what are the known examples are there you try to based on those known examples and you try to give the labels about those known known examples and you incorporate onto your system and if at all you see an unseen input which is not present in the previous training process or in the previous learning process and you try to predict what is the corresponding output based on the learned set of samples or the learned set of examples so this learning is going to take place until an accepted acceptable performance is achieved then once the system or the learn that model can be deployed onto your uh, uh, onto your raspberry pi or onto your a microcontroller onto your embedded system so that it can predict the unknown values properly and if you look to the unsupervised learning so whereas uh, the, this is the difference between supervised and unsupervised in unsupervised you are not going to uh, give the labels in, in other terms annotations are not going to be existing so you don't know uh, you are not specifying what that particular sample is all about so such kind of information is not going to be given here in unsupervised learning so basically in unsupervised learning the, there is going to be uh, a process where you are going to extract the relationships between those set of samples itself so you are going to discover the hidden relations that are existing on the data so you are going to discover the hidden relations that are existing on the sensor data that you have been collecting and obviously the system is getting learned about that particular data based on the set of samples from x1 to xk so what is the relation between x1 and xk if there is a correlation between x1 and xk and the correlation is very minimal of course we, by quantitative measures we can try to understand what can be those uh, distances between those values and so on and so forth so thus correlation values obviously if they are all uh, having the similarities or such kind of stuff is existing between those samples you collected so obviously that process are been uh, those samples are been uh, grouped together in a, a technical name called as clustering so the clustering is one particular process where you try to group Uh, samples which are of having similar nature or similar properties or similar characteristics and there is another also something called as association association rule mining uh, basically this is an association between two different set of samples and uh, what is the relation chain existing between these two uh, associations obviously categorizes the relation between them and you group them together or it's up to you based on your application requirements so you uh, take care of what is the set of values sir so here uh, in the unsupervised learning the machine gets learned or it, you are going to perform the training process so basically all examples are positive in the sense that there are going to be a known data and there is no labeling no annotations for the data that is being collected and of course that's what uh, no labeling means the no teacher there's no information given to that sample what is that sample is all about whereas in supervised learning the annotations takes place and in the training process also there is no single correct answer you are going to give as a sample to the learning process so where you are going to practically use this kind of unsupervised learning so in this this unsupervised learning basically you can make use of in the deriving the groups which are not explicitly labeled something like uh, if you are collecting the data from a, a human person like the heart beats the uh, skin temperatures and of course the uh, some kind of uh, values that you are going to collect it from the uh, human being uh, you try to group those set of values so heart beats uh, and based on those heart beats the skin temperature uh, or the temperature of the person itself then you can try to assess or what type of uh, in the situation the person is like the set of emotions so whenever a person is happy so you can get the heart beats and as well as you can see the skin conductance or the skin temperature or the of course the body temperature and you know, so on and so forth once those sensors are been giving certain values you can easily understand those set of values if the person is happy then you can classify or you can cluster them as an happy group uh, set of values from those particular person uh, if it is very uh, worried or if it is a sad person and what is that particular situation where you can try to collect those sensor values and group them and classify them and make them as a clusters like this a uh, practical usage is uh, enormous uh, where is a different applications similarly you can see it in the market basket analysis the association rule mining uh, the uh, it basically it relates to the uh, customer buying set of objects or certain things from a, a supermarket so what is the probability that he is going to buy uh, a, a, an item when he buys a certain other items too 
So this kind of analysis is going to be useful in terms of your unsupervised learning. Similarly, the same philosophy is going to be applied for your IoT sensors data too. So let us see, try to understand uh, with a small example here, uh, two-dimensional data and its trend line, how you are going to uh, get a trend line for this particular uh, set of data values. Suppose you, are, you have collected certain weights and heights of a person and uh, a certain people, and you plot a graph between the uh, relation between the weight and the height. So for a particular weight of a person, what is its corresponding height? You plot a graph in, it, in a two-dimensional plane and you try to understand uh, uh, what can be the appropriate line which is going to map to this set of weights and heights in simple terms. So simply, uh, we try to look into the uh, mining process, the analysis process, something called as gradient descent or a best fit line, which can, uh, the line which can fit the points between your X and Y coordinate values more appropriately. So that best fit line will always uh, will help you to find out an unknown point if it is given an unknown uh, X value is given, what can be the corresponding Y value. So based on the past data, that particular best fit line can always will give you the most uh, most accurate answer for you. So to build up this best fit line, we do have certain process called as gradient descent. So the errors are going to be minimized and the, once the errors are minimizing, then obviously you are, you are going to get that particular best fit line which fits those particular set of coordinate values. So this is just a small uh, idea to get into that. How do you formulate, uh, of course, how do you get a mathematical equation? So this in our school days, you have already done y is equal to mx plus c. So if you, are, you all have a set of x values, then you get a regression line for this y is equal to mx plus c based on you find out the slope and you find the constant value and you get the regression line and you can predict for a new x value what can be the corresponding y value for an unknown x value like this this is the same philosophy you also can apply on to you also apply on to your iot systems data for various ambient sensors like temperatures and of course the humidity the gaseous of course some kind of predictions also can be done with the help of time series data analysis we can uh, formulate those things in the real time when the IoT data is getting originated. But remember uh, one thing, most of the people, uh, of course, do look for, do you need maths to work with ML? Of course, uh, yes, mathematics fundamentals is required, but as such is not required for directly incorporating with the ML for the IoT data. So here, as such, the data science philosophy is very much required rather than the uh, basic maths and the maths philosophy. So the data science obviously will enable you to have a proper model, a machine learning model to be built up instead of looking more or instead of looking into the depth of that particular mathematics. If you try to follow the data science principles, then obviously you can come up with a better model for, for the IoT systems to be used in a proper way. So here uh, we are trying to see some of these uh, data science philosophies like this. Uh, when you prepare or line or any line is being prepared for you from the set of values, whether the line is the most appropriate one or not, whether it is having certain bias to certain set of values, or whether it is a high variance with certain set of values, or if it is a, a good compromise a line which is separating the linearly separate separable line between the set of samples and all. So this kind of philosophy is very much required to prepare before you deploy your uh, machine learning model onto your IoT system. So the underfittings and overfittings processing has to be taken care. Otherwise, your IoT systems uh, predictions and the uh, learning process, and of course, the getting the accurate results is not going to be appropriate. So of, rather than looking to the mathematics itself, if you can understand how do you overcome the high bias or underfittings, and how do you overcome the overfittings and high variances, if that philosophy is known to you, that kind of philosophy is sufficient for you to build up your own machine learning model here. And another important thing for IoT systems data with respect to machine learning is that, is it a machine learning task? Always you need to assess for yourself. If it is not a machine learning task, it is not meant for you to deploy it on the IoT system. So in the sense that IoT is basically consisting of your sensors, the communication system, the data analysis and so on and so forth. So please make sure that all things cannot be realized in the sense that it's not that compulsorily machine learning or AI process should be running on your IoT systems. No, you have to look for whether your machine learning. So machine learning is basically your machine is getting learned from the IoT data itself. 
it's not that always you are going to machine is going to learn or machine may not be able to learn also in some context some applications where it cannot fit uh, your machine learning approaches cannot fit into that particular context so you need to be very careful on on whether to choose a machine learning uh, process on your iot systems data or not so once you choose that is think that is a machine learning process can be easily uh, run or is can be deployable or it can be prepared and run or uh, employable on for iot systems then also you should take also take care of whether it is a suitable model you have identified or whether your correct features have been used in this machine learning process or not or proper evaluation metrics the metrics which will tell you the performance characteristics of the machine learning process whether it is been done properly or not so you need to assess yourself before you try to go for designing and developing your machine learning model and you are trying to deploy on your iot systems so obviously to have a suitable model you need to have sufficient data or enough data in the sense uh, usually iot data in the beginning stages you will have only few, if there are only few sensors and you just want to have your machine learning model with only with few sensors it is not appropriate and you cannot say that your machine learning model is working fine with only just a few sensors that few sensors has to generate a lot of data over a period of time then your machine gets learned properly here so these are some of those constraints you need to make sure that machine learning is not just simply uh, uh, developing it and deploying it onto your iot systems so there's a lot of uh, uh, features engineering processes to takes place whether you have a good evaluation data set is there or not so just it is not an offline analysis because iot systems don't work on the offline data models please do remember so offline data modeling is completely different and because iot data a continuous stream of uh, data is going to generate is going to be generated and it is to be processed in the real time to get the accurate decisions so offline data analysis which you have done may not fit into the iot systems in the most of the applications so that is one point you need to look into for so this in to uh, dwell into the more diagnosis steps a uh, little bit examples i have given you is it an ml task are you sure an M a machine learning is required for your iot system something like this if suppose there is x is an independent of y then obviously you cannot have some kind of relation over there uh, in the sense that uh, if you have name age and income of a person and you are trying to expect what is the height of that person then obviously you may not get a correct answer so with only having name age and income of various persons uh, you will not be able to predict what the height of the person is so for that kind of situations for that kind of problems uh, it is not preferable to have a machine learning task at all so don't go for simply that uh, to have a machine learning you have to prepare a machine learning model where your x and y are something like this which are independent such kind of situations your model will not work at all so again if is x is high set with limited variations then you cannot configure what can be the y value is so with limited variations you cannot prepare your model so your wide range of uh, variations and as well as wide range of set of values are required to configure uh, the machine learning model uh, set of values why similarly you have to choose where, what you go for whether you want to go for supervised learning or whether you are good, want to go for unsupervised learning or you have to go for uh, other sets of learning processes you have to decide and then only you need to look for some people just for research purpose or for certain practice purpose simply they try to mix up these machine learning techniques and they say that they are uh, of course there's something mix mix in the sense that you combine those methods and you try to just simply run it on a uh, offline data modeling uh, saying that this can be used for an iot model that does not fit at all so please do remember if you really want to explore the machine learning models then you, you have to really set up the iot system then only you can deploy or you can uh, develop your own machine learning model and deploy it in a proper way so the next coming to this uh, appropriate model yes the data size is the most important factor uh, small data you can go for linear models obviously when you have a large data with large variations you can go for uh, non linear models uh, like your neural networks also can be mostly uh, uh, appropriate and if you have sparse data of course before the sparse data sometimes may not give the proper relations among those data samples so you require certain kind of normalization process to be uh, performed before you try to use that data for building the model and of, and of course you have certain imbalanced data too so if at all you only have certain uh, biasings or certain uh, kinds of uh, categories of data which is been high quantity and some quantities of data which is not there at all so don't prefer for those imbalanced data too 
and obviously it is for sure that in iot systems there will be a lot of noisy data noisy data in the sense that you are playing with the electronic systems when you are using the electronic systems it is highly vulnerable to have certain kinds of uh, uh, spikes in your electronic voltages and your electronic signals or in your instrumentations uh, sometimes you may be not getting the values from the sensors too there may be so many other issues too with the sensors and instrumentations too so the data quality is also very much important when you are preparing your machine learning model for a iot system so all these factors are very much required for you are going to design your develop and you prepare a machine learning model for an iot systems so similarly the features that you collect from those iot data uh, should be sufficient enough to uh, have a meaningful information generated so you are going to build up a machine learning model uh, if you have certain qualities of features and the feature engineering you have to make sure that the best strategy and the best performance uh, have to be incorporated on your machine learning model if you want to run the system for robust and robustly you need to run for a longer period of time then obviously you have to look for a better engineering purposes here so and the last step is basically uh, anything that you design and develop it you please make sure that the model is getting validated uh, with the scientifically proven methods so the scientifically proven methods uh, obviously something like accuracy is precision uh, recalling uh, f1 scores area under curves uh, like this you have so many other uh, parameters scientifically so depending on your application where you are going to use your machine learning model so please make sure that you are performing the validations for the whatever the proposed model you are going to use it for your iot systems so now coming to uh, the type of algorithms in machine learning basically you have seen so far supervised and unsupervised these are unsupervised uh, and supervised you can have it the algorithms can be classified into linear non linear and special algorithms too so basically the linear algorithms are those which can can linearly separable uh, a line can easy, easily separate two different set of classes of values uh, so a linear a line can be able to distinguish between those two classes of samples then obviously you call it as a linear algorithm if there is a wide range or wide uh, space existing between those set of samples you can go for a support vector machines and of course there is a relation between the variables and the labels itself you can go for a regression models if there are non linear algorithms you can go for a neural networks or a decision trees and so on and so forth and there are other special algorithms too as far as the machine learning uh, methodologies are concerned you can call it as ordinal regressions based on the ranks values you can uh, prescribe and you can classify the values you can poisson distributions of the probability set of values and the bayesian uh, networks please remember uh, as far as iot systems are concerned because iot systems are the real systems which are working uh the probability uh, functionalities are going to be very much uh, in minimal in the sense that please don't uh, uh, project or don't propose the probability distribution functions for an iot system because uh, probability distribution functions uh, always will is an assumptions basically you have a constraints the probability so probability values will always uh, that particular type of modeling may not be an apt one for the Uh, iot system of applications for most of the times because you in iot system you have a real system there on the real system the things are going to work so whenever you design and develop your machine learning models you need to be very careful which type of algorithms which type of modeling has to be taken place so just for uh, some kind of uh, 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 doing certain works and all people do go for uh, poisson distributions bayesian networks some kind of stuff uh, which you do want to realize it for an unknown things so please do not uh, go into that particular direction please so the model performance is there are certain metrics that uh, everybody needs to understand whenever you develop a machine learning model so uh, area under curves uh, region of uh, interest uh, these are the certain parameters usually when you uh, take the samples data from the iot data uh, you need to calculate what is the uh, true positive rates and the false positive rates whether they are really uh, happening the outcomes are happening or not based on the samples that you have taken and you have prepared the model so these are the other key performance indicators area under the curve so obviously it gives us the sensitivity and the specificity for the what are the values that you are going to uh, take it prepare it model it and you are going to validate and test it so always the scientific uh, 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 these particular concepts are going to be useful for you to validate your uh, model uh, which is running on the real iot systems definitely these are going to be practically uh, applicable and this one going to be useful too 
So similarly, you can use the coefficient of determination R square value, which is almost equivalent to one is a very perfect system, but usually you will not get those kind of values for a, a real IoT systems because of so many other constraints with the sensor systems, the communication, the data processing and all such kind of stuffs are there. So it is always difficult to get a perfect system to, uh, for your machine learning model. So you can use the simple uh, mean absolute errors, uh, these kind of techniques which you are studied in your school days. So always it will be helpful for you to prepare uh, an apt equation or an apt model for a set of samples. So I just quickly covered uh, some of those points where your machine learning people try to prepare a machine learning model and uh, try to deploy it on your IoT system. So let us come back uh, the tools, how we can use those existing tools which are there in the market, uh, which will help us to do certain data analysis uh, from the IoT data that you collect here. So the ten, uh, as I mentioned in the last session, uh, the tools like TensorFlow is going to be mostly uh, apt for the IoT system. So you can refer to that. Yesterday we have seen the TensorFlow Lite. Now today we'll see another tool called TensorFlow.js. So .js corresponds to uh, JavaScript. So uh, why JavaScript is very much required for IoT? So people do assume or do have an impression that uh, Python is the most appropriate uh, software programming tool for most of the IoT applications. Uh, but I would like to present in a, another perspective here. Uh, there's an, another uh, point to be understood by all the people. See, even Java, JavaScript is the most, uh, uh, it can be the most appropriate uh, option as a programming language for IoT too. It need not be uh, Python, but the JavaScript. So let me put something here, uh, why JavaScript is going to be very much useful for IoT. So JavaScript is the easier access to rich sensor data. So you can, using the JavaScript, uh, you can easily collect the temperature data. So if you look to the first slide, which I kept here, so this first slide, which shows the temperature data here, the temperature data present at a particular location in a particular room. So obviously this is a, a JSON format. So it is a JSON format, which is a, a, a similar to your JavaScript, which is very much useful for your data analysis. So the direct to JavaScript integration makes it easy to connect your model to device inputs such as your microphones or your webcams. So your JavaScript can easily integrate with your hardware devices too. So since the same browser code runs on mobile devices, you can also make use of your accelerometers, GPSs, and gyroscopes. So actually yesterday's sessions, you're seeing Dr. Satish Rimasar sir has enlightened us that you can use your mobile phone as a, a computational devices for your sensors. Mobile phone itself has accelerometers, GPSs, gyroscopes, and other sets of sensors which are there on your mobile phone. So you can make use your mobile phone, but one thing when you want to run the code which you collect the data from those sensors, obviously you are going to prefer for a browser. So your IoT devices, your browser is going to be the most important entity here. That's what the browser has gained a lot of importance in the last uh, four or five years. And people for IO, uh, people working in IoT domains, they have uh, run many applications on the browser so that it can the program can be easily deployable, easily run on different platforms, on different hardware devices, and which are going to be easily uh, adaptable. So training on mobile remains challenging due to hardware limitations as of early 2019. So if you see until last two years, uh, how uh, IoT data can be trained, uh, how IoT data is collecting the data from various sensors, from the environment, from other sets of things. It is very difficult as far as the mobile phones, uh, using the mobile phones is concerned. But from the last two years, two, three years onwards, mobile phones are very sophisticated. Where, of course, the cost is coming down and you are increasing the processing capabilities on the mobile phone itself. So there is a lot of advantages are there. So you need not buy extra hardware gadgets as a gateways or a processing units, you know, not by, you can make use of your own mobile phone as, uh, as an Android or a iOS or a Windows or operating system mobile phones, and you can start using them to develop your own uh, uh, IoT uh, with along with the machine learning approaches too. So the on-device training will become easier over the next few years. People are trying to do this kind of stuff. So today uh, in this session, I will show you how uh, people are doing, uh, of course, uh, how, what we are doing also in the, on the browser, how machine learning can be incorporated in the browser and so on and so forth. So that we'll see. Um, so various aspects like how mathematics is going to be useful because some of the participants are uh, uh, very curious to know how mathematics can be used in the IoT. So let me, uh, I'll get back to those applications in this uh, session itself. So let us see, uh, because 
and the browser is the most important processing unit now nowadays so that's why the in order to run your machine learning model for an iot uh, device such as your mobile your javascript is the most appropriate option so there's another uh, reason also you have to look into consideration use of a javascript for iot data never leaves the client's device this is the most important thing because whenever you are collecting some information related to persons or uh, uh, some other entities where uh, privacy is the most important uh, consideration so if the privacy is most important consideration for the persons being monitored like the patients in the hospitals or by yourself only and you don't want to send the data to another machine or to the cloud then obviously but the data has to be processed and some kind of decisions have to be done then obviously you prefer for a, a browser kind of stuff where your again your javascript is going to be the most important tool for that so this is a, a very crucial because the data never leaves the client's device so your mobile phone from your mobile phone obviously people say that people can hack your phone yes people can hack your phone provided you can uh, keep your uh, that sensors data or your own data in a secure manner that is also possible otherwise if you might have seen the examples like various uh, massive data scandals that happened in the re very recent past security breaches are there and uh, the, e this can be easily avoided when you encrypt your data and you can store it on your mobile phones too so this uh, javascripts for iot uh, can be easily realized using one particular software tool called as tensorflow.js so users can take advantage of this ai without sending their personal data over network and share it with a third party it is for their own purpose so the client provides the compute power of course your mobile is itself is the computing power and uh, your mobile phone also has various apps obviously you can share the data on the apps easily all this is possible through your javascripts so let me dwell upon uh, what is this uh, tensorflow.js is so uh, yesterday you have seen a tensorflow light but the tensorflow light is meant for your embedded systems uh, which that particular tensorflow light is a deep learning framework machine learning framework itself that is running on your a uh, small uh, resource constraint computing devices like your raspberry pi and microcontrollers but this tensorflow.js you can easily run on your browsers so this is like a, a, a you can call it as a library you can call it as a software is basically a tool which will help you to prepare your own machine learning models uh, uh, on the data that is being collected on the browser using the cameras or using the audio or using the other sensors which are connected to your own systems so it is possible to add machine learning capabilities to any web application which is existing uh, you can add, uh, use your apis to build and train models right in the browser or you can use the node.js server applications and you can use tensorflow.js to run existing models in your javascript environment so let us see what is this tensorflow.js so let me just show you some those people who are not uh, familiar with tensorflow.js let me give you some basic examples on how to run tensorflow.js on the browser so let us uh, i'll just show you some of those practice things on how to use the tensorflow.js on the browser and we'll see one uh, uh, demo on how you can run your uh, tensorflow.js uh, program on the browser which is having in a uh, neural network of the set of tensors itself so that's let us see proceed now uh, let us go to a browser so i am using a browser here so the browser is basically yeah so you can you open your own browser so you can go to tensorflow.org so if you go to the official website tensorflow obviously i told you yesterday in the last class that is basically belongs to google so google is maintaining all the sets of these values so you can see here tensorflow tensorflow for javascript and the third option is tensorflow for mobile and iot so for mobile and iot you use tensorflow lite and you can see for javascript so you can use tensorflow javascript training and deploying the models in the browser itself so you can go to the tensorflow.js website so you can see the url has come to this now of course you have different tutorials here you can see the tutorials in the later stages when you have some time but we do uh, try to understand and to try to practice these tutorials otherwise you are not going to uh, get the basic idea behind this until unless you do the practice so i am selecting an api application programming interface so the tensorflow is given the complete information about 
uh, what are all these tensors. So yesterday I was telling to you, a tensor is basically a generalization of a vector, uh, is a, a potentially a higher dimensional uh, matrix. So this you have seen uh, the small examples in the last. So let us see how to uh, uh, simulate or how do you understand these tensors when you run it on your browser. So to run it on the browser, uh, what you require is basically you require a notepad. So I can take the notepad. You can use it your Visual Studio or you can <clears throat> any other notepad which is uh, uh, having certain kind of uh, integrated development environment is preferable for you. So I just take a notepad here, right? So in the notepad, I just write a small program here. Of course, this is basically an HTML program. So what I have written is basically this is what your HTML script writing. So you have an, uh, a web page. The web page can be web page or your some pages which are going to be run on your process. Usually you call it as a web pages. So the web pages programming language is basically your scripting languages such as HTML. So HTML is this is the syntax. Uh, these are the called as tags. So you have a different set of tags. Each tag has got its own uh, functionalities. So you have a tag called head. So it is usually meant for uh, output section on the head, head section of your web page. And on the web page, you have a body section, which always gives you certain kind of elements, the components which can be interacted and which can be displaying certain values. So in the head section, I am giving one a statement here, something called as a script tag. Script is the name of the tag here, and the source is equal to. So this is the source for your TensorFlow, which is available on this particular cloud. So Content Developer Network (CDN) stands for Content Developer Network. So uh, uh, whenever the latest versions are there, are there, you can easily try to uh, retrieve this. So this I'm looking for TensorFlow JS uh, two version. Of course, you have the latest three version is also being coming. The last one it has been released. So anyway, uh, I'm using this particular version now. So you have a minimal version of this TensorFlow. So I'm just connecting into this model. When, when the web page is rendered onto my browser, it means the web page is loaded onto my browser. So you are going to execute these statements. Uh, this statement is basically meant like a connecting, like a, uh, it's like a library, which you are going to use it for your certain instructions on your body section. So you are including this library. Uh, this is one way you can connect your, if you have an internet, if you don't have an internet, uh, uh, what I suggest to you is you please download this file and store it in your local machine and you give the path, the source path. Obviously, this particular library will be available on your local machine. You need not connect all the time to run uh, your programs and test it for various purposes. So this is also possible. So there are various libraries. You can directly download it and store it locally and use the uh, libraries for various uh, your application purposes. So here, uh, once you just I'm giving the name of this particular file, just uh, a3.html, a small example, name I'm giving. And let me store it in this folder itself. The day three dot, so of course this file is basically an HTML scripting file. You're giving the extension as dot HTML. So they save this file. So once you save, obviously, these are the just simple statements. How you are able to see the screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, the text on the screen is visible, please. Is it okay? Yeah. Sinua, sir? Mm -hmm. Sir, visible, sir. Uh, okay. Visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. So let me just zoom it a little bit. Uh, just hold on. Now this, I think the text is visible to you. Fine. So now let us run this particular file on the browser itself. So I'll just open. So I stored the file here, day3.html. I'm just double click here. So it is opened here. Now you cannot see anything here, nothing is there. That's what you're not given any heading, you're not given any uh, uh, links or nothing. That's why this is simply a, a blank file. So let us simply write something like this in the heading section. 
I use another tag, something like head heading section. So every tag has got its uh, delimiters, like the end tag is there. So this heading tag is been closed. So I just save it here. Now go back to the file and just refresh it. So obviously you can see now example for using a tensorflow.js. So this is not actually what is wanted here. So any uh, a developer, a web developer or a practitioner or a beginner who is trying to write those programs using on this set of things, please go to uh, this more tools which are available on this particular browser and go to the developer tools. See here, your developer tools are available. Just click the developer tools. So you'll get the console prompt of this developer uh, tools, which will tell us what is exactly happening in the background. So the background instructions are getting executed on this console only basically. So now you can trace it back and you will see what the things are going on here. So before we go here, just keep the screens like this for you to get understand here. So what actually happened here is in this program, I just, uh, my script file, my file is connected to TensorFlow uh, library. This is what TensorFlow.js library has been now imported onto my browser. So you are not seeing anything here as of now as with respect to the tensor. <clears throat> so let us now run the, uh, I'll take the samples from here only from the official documentation website. So I just copy here, please see here carefully. I'm just tf.tensor. So tensor is basically, a, a, it can be an array, is basically a multi-dimensional array. So it can be a single dimension or a double dimension or three dimensional or four dimensional, five dimension, six dimensions. If you see on the left side of the screen, so it can be from scalar to a six dimensional or it can be a multi-dimensional and dimensional. So it is basically a generalization of a vector. So you can have any, any number of dimensions here. So basically the dimensions are meant to uh, for storing the values, a huge quantity of values. So yesterday you have seen an image. So that image values have been stored in the form of a tensor in the 1001 labels when the program is getting done. So how is that possible? Because the tensors are holding that much of quantity of information. So anyway, that is uh, to understand that by basics also, I'm once again, I'm coming back to this. So just copying this command tf.tensor. So tf is the tensor flow. Once the library is loaded onto your web page, so you can access that particular uh, library through tf dot tensor. The basic tensor is this. So I will write, I just running on the console prompt. So tf dot tensor, and I'm just printing that. So this is what a tensor is getting printed here. So one, two, three, four is a array values. And that particular array values are printed. The tensor is, uh, the tensor consists of a simple uh, single dimensional array set of values. So let us see a simple thing here. and. Uh, let us go with some more examples here instead of, uh, yes, uh, two dimension. Let us go with a two dimensional example here. Uh, of course, everybody knows what is a two dimension is. So TF dot tensor two dimensional instruction statement is something like this. Go here and just simply run. So you are getting a two dimensional. Two dimensional, you have a, a rows and columns here. This is basically a two dimension, 2D, tensor 2D. Then come back to your 3D. So similarly, you can go with the 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, you can practice on your own. So you need not have any software for this. Just you try to provide the library and you start practicing here. So what is this tensor looks like? Please understand these are your 3D values. So the 3D tensor is printing on your screen. Of course, I hope you are able to see the values. Are you able to see the values, Srinivas sir? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. just, so just caution me if there is something uh, not able to see and all, okay? Yes, sir, sure. So here coming to this. So this is basically your three dimension values. Uh, so like this, you, all the set of methods and the functionalities are available. So you can just have a practice on this. Now, if you are going to build up a neural network model on this browser itself. So let me just go you through what is this neural network model. So you can build, there are uh, models which are given by the TensorFlow, uh, something called a sequential or in a generic model here. The sequential model is one that uh, the output values of one layer has been connected to the uh, input as for the next layer. It means every layers are getting connected with each other without any branches or without any uh, skipping the values. So you can use the sequential model. So the sequential model is uh, meant for to prepare your neural network model, like where you have seen 
a non-linear model can be easily realized using neural networks. So, uh, of course, I have not gone very depth in that uh, AI and machine learning. I've just given you an overview. So, I presume that uh, because these sessions are not exclusively meant for uh, uh, going the AI, ML, and the data analysis parts. So, just I'm giving you brief ideas how these things can be realized on the IoT systems, please. So, please refer. Of course, the official documentation is available to you all. You can prepare your models like this. So, uh, a neural network model. A constant is nothing but a data type of a particular variable here. The object variable is model is equal to TF dot sequential. So once a neural network model uh, uh, model consists of number of layers. So in each layer, you will have different set of neurons. So that you, each neuron is going to have certain kind of functionalities. So these are the basic things that uh, it, it can be easily realized using this tensorflow.js rather than the Python program itself. And the program can run on any machine in the sense that using a browser, you run it on your mobile system or your laptop or anything. You are running a machine learning model on a IoT device. So that's what the advantage here is. So I will show you one program here. So the program is basically same thing uh, here. Of course, this is a head section which a library file is connected here. That is tensorflow.js. And in the body section, uh, you have written another JavaScript, actually, a JavaScript which is going to do certain value here. So what is this particular value is? We'll talk about it. So here I have given the source file is a tf underscore js underscore one. And what is happening is in this, this is your JavaScript file. So what is this written in the JavaScript, the actual logic of your program here? So here, uh, this is just a function. The name of the function is learn linear function. Uh, and this is the definition of the function. And just this is a file which is nothing but simply calling this learn linear function. So you can just simply that a learn linear function, a function is getting executed in simple terms. So what exactly this function is doing? Please understand here. This is a function. The, 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 you are clearly mentioning that this is a function. So and what type of this function is? It is basically an asynchronous function. What is it asynchronous means? So for time being, just keep it uh, aside. I'll come back to that. Once the execution is completed, you will try to understand on your own. If not, I will give the answer why this is an asynchronous one. So here, let us see the definition of this function, learn linear. So here, the first statement is, uh, once you have the library TensorFlow has been uh, included into your web page. So once it is included, you can access the TensorFlow library using your TF. That's what he has given here, tf.sequential. So this statement, tf.sequential, indicates that you are going to prepare a neural network model, a machine learning model. Neural network model is itself is a subset of your uh, machine learning process here. So here, a model is the name. So this model is nothing but is of what type? A sequential type. Why it is a sequential? Because what is sequential again? I, I'll come back to this. A sequential model is any model where the outputs of one layer are the inputs to the next layer. So it means there is a connections between the layers and there is no skips and there, you can, uh, there is no branches. It means every layers are getting, uh, e e getting connected with each other. So that is the meaning of a sequential model. That's what you are using the same sequential model here. Now, what you are doing this to this model, you're adding, this model is being added with certain layers. So here, how many layers? So there is only uh, input shape. That's what the syntax here is. So you are adding the number of layers. And in that layer, you are adding only one particular neuron. That is the input. One input shape here. One unit is there. One neuron unit is there. And only one, one particular input. So what is that you are doing with these layers? Uh, what is that you are going to do here? Before you come to this model.compile, let me just give you here what is the actual programming logic is. So there is an array of values. So this basically that area of values is your tensor two-dimensional array of values. So you are giving a two-dimensional value to a x values. Similarly, you are giving another two-dimensional values to a y vector. So there is an x vector and there is a y vector. In other terms, there is an x set and there is a y set. X sets and y sets. Now you might have understood what uh, application I'm trying to look into first. This is you are trying to predict. Uh, so you are going to prepare a model, you are going to make the machine to learn. So uh, machine is going to learn for a X value 1.1, the corresponding Y value is 39343. Similarly, for a X value 1.3, the corresponding value is 46205. So this values, it means for uh, each and X value, for each and every X value, there is a corresponding Y value. 
So you have a set of X values and you have a set of Y values. How many values are there here in X and how many values are there in Y? In this example, in this small example for you to understand, I prepared just a 30 X values. So for each uh, 30 X values, uh, you have a corresponding 30 Y values. So here, once you prepare a model, once you train the model with your X values, which are having the corresponding Y values, then you give an unknown value. So the unknown X value you're going to give it here. So in this particular area of values, the unknown value X value is the 12. So I'm trying to predict what can be the unknown value uh, for X value 12. So I'm going to predict, do a prediction here from the two dimensional data. So this is a set of values. So these values for you to understand, I've just prepared a small thing, but when you do in the real times, these are nothing but your sensor data. So you collect that temperature values on a particular days and you can try to predict once you collect for six months or seven months, once your data has been uh, sufficient quantity has come and once your regression line is formed properly and once your model is learned properly with all the set of values, you can try to predict what can be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the day after the sixth month. So something like that, you can have certain kind of predictions. Similarly, your banking transactions, your mess in the sense uh, forecastings, all these models, so your regression models can be easily realized on your machine learning models. Here. So these are the set of values of X's and Y's here that you are seeing. And once you have the set of X and Y, what is that you're doing? You're doing a model compile. So you, the model compilation will enable you to prepare your model to learn on what is the loss functions you need to consider. So you, okay, as I mentioned in the slides, you can use different uh, existing uh, methods like mean squared errors. You have to minimize the losses uh, between your uh, uh, the uh, prepared line or the obtained line and the actual X value, actual the sample value. So you can use a set of, uh, uh, these are so many loss functions are there for you. Of course, in this example, I've given you a mean squared error. If you want to have more set of loss functions, you can refer to this uh, tensor flow. You can find it, uh, there are so many other, uh, uh, activation functions as well as the advanced activation. You can see the ReLU functions are there, softmax are there. So you can, uh, depending on your requirements, if you want to test it for different models, different uh, philosophies, you can use those set of functions and you can uh, assimilate and understand those things. And the sigmoidal deviations is the optimizer function used for that neural network model. So let us simply run this program and see what can be this. So this is the program uh, TensorFlow. So I just put it in the TensorFlow examples here. So this TensorFlow example is just hold on one second. Uh, let me open the file. Okay. So I'm just now running this uh, file here. So far the TensorFlow, this let me close this program. And uh, this program also is being closed. Right now I'm just running this. So of course he has not come anything here. Now you got the tensor value here. Of course the uh, labeling I have not done. That's why you will not be able to see here. So this is the value you get it. The uh, 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 prediction value for an unknown value of 12. So let me just change the value uh, something like, so in the set of X values, there is no 13 or uh, something like 20. Of course, you are going to deviate much here from the set of X values. Definitely that accuracy may not be there. But anyway, nevertheless, to understand this, I'm giving a new a random value here. So in the, there is no 20 value in the set of X values. Now I just save this. Now, I, once again, I run the file. Of course, you can neatly design your web pages and you can say this is a new set of value that you get obtained based on those set of X values. So this is one example that you need to understand here, uh, the machine learning model, like a neural network model, which you're running on the uh, web browser itself. This is one small example, the predictions from the two dimensional data using your tensorflow.js. So not only this, uh, I'd like to show you some other examples here, just hold on, I have the source codes of other things. So instead of uh, directly running through the notepad, I will show you the another way also. We'll take another uh, IDE that is called Visual Studio.
So let just the participants try to understand here. So we have an, another program here. Uh, I'll just run the program, then you'll be able to understand. Just hold on for a second. I'll just load the program. So this is one program, yeah. So you can see this, this simple HTML file. Of course, in the head section, you have several libraries, which are basically your TensorFlow only. TensorFlow.js uh, libraries. There are other libraries too. And there is one script file which has been written here, script.js. I'll open that file in the later stage. But let me first run the program. So now the program gets run on your browser. Uh, just hold on. I think the, my Zoom camera, the camera has been on with the Zoom uh, purpose. So I need to disable it once again. So, uh, of course, uh, now are you able to see me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. We are, we are able to see you, sir. Yeah. So I on my webcam here. Now you can see my hand properly. So something, yeah. Now what you see here on my hand, is it visible, Srinivasan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's basically, Points we could see, yeah, sir. Yeah, this is my hand pose. So uh, the hand pose is basically one example which is trying to detect the key points on my hand. Okay. So this is one small program. Now, nowadays, is very much required. Is like this face face mask, hand mask, all these things are coming into picture now. So let me show you another example. Uh, is my screen visible, Sinwa sir? Yes, sir. You are visible, sir. Oh, okay, fine. So okay. Yeah, yeah. Just I'll Can show you one second. Now, this is another deep learning framework, uh, deep learning model. So, this is basically one of my MTech student is currently doing on this. Uh, you can see the outputs there. So his name is Ashish. Now he is right now just next to me only in this lab. <laughs> so he is working on this project actually, uh, one of the gate analysis. So you can start. So he has written this program. This is also a machine learning model which we are trying to uh, deploy it onto the Raspberry Pi as well as on the mobile 
system itself. So you can see you are measuring the different parameters here. Of course, uh, the doctors are also involved in assessing how far the system is going to work properly. So uh, I just for the mathematics background participants. Uh, so we, here the mathematics people uh, work is very much required here. So if you see, this is basically a, a human pose, pose estimations. The key points of the uh, human person is being tracked upon here. Still the accuracies are not there, but the basic philosophy of this one is basically the mathematics only. So uh, I, if the people who are interested in this, I'll definitely discuss with them what exactly the mathematics is required for this to improve this. So I'm really looking for those uh, people who want to work on this particular PoseNet model. So as of now, we have achieved to some extent, but we want to increase the accuracy, which you want to run it on the mobile phone. And we want to give it for every, every person that is, we have to put it in the Google apps. So that this is what our important is. This is basically an IoT stuff only again. And uh, like this, this is basically a deep learning neural network framework. So this is how the program is. Of course, the tensorflow.js only again. Uh, only thing is, this is all related to your HTML scriptings, but here we have the tensorflow.js. So like this, there are certain applications. Uh, once the time comes in the afternoon session, we'll see some more examples. And if you see the more example codes, uh, you can also get it from my book. So the latest book is this. Already the existing books are there uh, for Internet of Things and Smartphones. You can search it on books on my name here. So one book is getting now, it is in the production stage. Hopefully by next month, the book will be available in the market. So this book obviously discusses about how your machine learning can be easily developed and it can be incorporated onto your IoT devices. So whatever the slides I have just discussed here, so beginning machine learning in the browser. So this is basically for the IoT devices too. Of course, there's a lot of examples are there and a lot of uh, stuff is also being taken care of here. And there is a proposal for the advancements in the guide analysis. So you can try to look into this more in this particular book too. If you are looking for certain uh, smart home and internet of things, obviously uh, these books, the other books also will be helpful for you. And of course, my publications are also there on the net. Uh, those who are interested to see and to collaborate with me, you can discuss with me. So my publications, all latest publications with my students are available here. So you can just try to look here. Yeah. So now, now I give the time for the question answer sessions. So let me just wind up here with the slides. So basically this is what the demo I showed you. These are things then fine, question answer sessions. Thank you. So any questions please put forward now. Participants are requested to post their questions in the text box or raise their hands. So, Gyan Devi, madam, please uh, unmute yourself and. Uh... Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Sir, I'm working on IoT with healthcare. Oh. Sir, can I apply tensor flows? Uh, how can I collect real data from patient right. by using variable different types of devices? Yes, yes, yes. MQTT and so on. Have you any more, more best idea of? For this, key, how can I implement by using machine learning or whatever framework related to IoT healthcare? Yes. See, here, ma'am, if you are going to have a variable sensors on the patient, that is one aspect. If there are not variable sensors, there's another aspect is there. Okay. So let, me, yeah, let me tell you, if there are variable devices, 
usually uh, patients basically the electronic instruments uh, for a patients uh, with respect to the healthcare applications uh, mostly they are going to have some variable devices to get monitoring certain uh, physiological parameters or whatever it may be so once you collect the data uh, means you you are devices which are connected on the body the body area networks the wireless sensor networks will be there of course so your those data is going to be collected onto a processing unit so you are going to have a, a device you are going to keep it whether it is inside the room or outside the room or not in the building or in some other location it's up to you so you can collect the data and you can process the data if you want to have only a mobile phone to be used for you to process the data using your tensor flow is most appropriate if you want to have others data which is being collected continuously then you can prefer for a more uh, processing unit either you can have a laptop with you and you can design your uh, machine learning model by collecting all the data and preparing a machine learning model and based on certain conditions what are the predictions can be done you have to formulate that in your program hello yeah madam uh, uh, is it your doubt is clarified madam hi yes sir thank you very much sir thank you yeah. no these these are already there already uh, the hospitals people and all people are uh, very much means uh, of course you not uh, exactly onto the robotics but uh, nowadays most of the hospitals they are using uh, robotics for uh, surgeries and other things but uh, for a uh, means for the elderly care as well as for the patients in the hospitals they do set up this uh, kind of uh, monitoring devices people who are suffering for uh, alzheimers or dementias certain kind of uh, indication systems uh, already there in the market uh, commercially available systems are also there if you are going to plan your own uh, designing and developing a system yes it is uh, whatever the knowledge you are getting from here it can be easily transformable to your practice there is not a problem at all yeah any other question ma'am any other questions please any other participants yeah madam ma uh, you can sir uh, i have one more query as i have seen so many papers uh, related this iot field and uh, healthcare are already published in billion trillion uh, yes. in good journals but uh, in implementation in hospitals or healthcare center i have never such uh, implementation in any exactly exactly, exactly. i'll get so I'll what get we point. are doing exactly ki we are showing in papers i am a little bit confused for this sir Yeah, yeah, I, I understood your point, ma'am. I understood yes. your point. Yes, I, yes. I'll, I, I'll tell you one thing, ma'am. For during yes. this, uh, sir, one more question. Yeah. During this global pandemic, we are all facing, as uh, you know well, whatever we have faced in last uh, year, sir. Can we, ma'am? I am a little bit very much confused. That we are written in papers, but no implementation in real. Yes. So please, sir, guide me. Yes, yes. i uh, i will tell you ma'am what exactly happened is in the hospitals why you you don't see this uh, uh, the actual implementations which are given from various papers uh this is monotonous ma'am i'll tell you uh, monotonous in the sense that these big big hospitals uh, big companies in the us europe and other things actually they have their patents and uh, what happens is those machines are very costly in fact and because they have their own patent and uh, these hospitals also rely on those machines because of the sophistication and as well as uh, on those machines which are been already managed by those uh, industries and the companies and the institutions and so on and so forth because of the patent rules now that, that's what as a product so those products similar products in india we don't have actually we only rely on those uh, foreign products but in fact uh, now the government has taken a good initiative of as uh, the atmanirbhar uh, concept something like that and now the hospitals in india also they are looking for some things like uh, uh, developing their own machines for their own uh, systems not relying on the crores of money on those equipments actually as far as the surgeries are concerned or the automation of processes anything on the hospital managements and so on and so forth so in the earlier days of course this research is the exploration what are the academic research we do basically the academic research is all we do is in a controlled environment 
it is not on a full fledged environment we do it in fact so we also do uh, this research with certain assumptions and certain conditions where uh, certain things only meet those things will work so that is just an exploration from the students and from the research community perspective of course the new things are getting evolved in this process but when you come to the in reality in practice so those machines and those things cannot easily be dumped onto the mesh, uh, person or on the human being so there needs to be very careful assessment and there needs to be the assessment has to be done for just not for simply 6 months assessment means validation i mean to say it cannot be done for 6 months or 1 year so it will be years together and until unless it is passed the test or the validations for years together it will not be commercially available product that's why the foreign companies they take huge quantity of money when they develop such kind of machines uh, the image processing machines or the surgery machines and all they do a lot of sophistication is there of course that's why but now in india our uh, hospitals and other industries too they are also relying on our uh, this uh, small scale industries and they are using it they are using for different different purposes of course for machine critical things uh, they are relying on the uh, export of those things but when they start using this uh, uh, the startup company products because the startup companies are only idea inventions so that's yes. why because of idea inventions so many products will, you are seeing so many papers so those are basically ideas the some kind of novelty they are showing either in terms of process or in terms of product or in terms of some small things only that's why so many papers have come so mm -hmm. even then you will not see a real product here for for some certain applications because they are all been developed in a controlled environment it's not meeting all the conditions there so that's why it will uh, slowly it will take time but nevertheless uh, you see this all advancements in the technology and as well as in the science so the technological advancements are very fast only nowadays so slowly every, everything is going to get automated in fact uh, more or less you cannot say in the iot term but automation is a generic term so definitely things are going to be automated for better purpose only So that is the reason. Sir, as you said, the advancement of technology. Uh, just uh, think, I am working on TensorFlow. There are different types of uh, third-party tool. New days introducing new application, new API, new a whatever I am doing. Is it feasible for me? That whatever I have used for my work uh, after three or four years, uh, value or not? Uh, 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 Ma'am, as far as the, as your question is absolutely correct. advancements are not always the same it means that's what advancements is going to takes place in new things yes sir so it, it, it will be definitely now the tensor flow has come just last two years or three years and it will be yes, there sir. for another four three four years or five years so uh, 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 top of that you will have a new technology definitely technologies are going to be evolved say uh, if you see 10 years back python was not there i mean yes, it is sir. there but not that of importance as given in the market See, mm -hmm. obviously, people are going to be. That's what our human tendency itself is. We require new things every day, so it will it will change the shape. But the philosophy is going to be there. It will just transform into a new. Uh, of course, it cannot be a new direction itself. See, like your mobile phone only, ma'am. If you see twenty uh, years back, how the, your mobile phone, what features. Yeah, right, are. right. So yeah. obviously, technology. Our uh, human nature is that we want a new things and new things. We are on to that new things only. so definitely we cannot rely for 10, 10 years or 20 years if you have seen the 20 25 years back a, a sony product is going to last for 20 25 years but now today those products are not going to last for more than 5 or 10 years at the maximum so yes, definitely sir. the government is also not going because we all have to survive this is just a, a business model ma'am to some extent if you want you can prepare a model that is but the basic philosophy is going to remain the same the concepts the communication standards uh, the instrumentation pur purposes the technology in instrumenting is going to change because nowadays sensors you are going to embed in your own body mm -hmm. you are yeah. engraving into on your body so the sizes and all is going to change so you cannot rely this is only temporary so yes, this is yes. completely old you have to change it you have to this is a, a inevitable you have to change there is no doubt in that one so we all want to change so definitely there will be change in the uh, technology aspects and we are going to see the more improvements in that direction yes sir thank you very much sir for a very much uh, informative session yes, and thank, thank you for answering thank, thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you best wishes sir uh, there is another question in the chat box sir may i read out or
yeah, yeah, yeah. Please tell me, sir, which one? So, how to get data from human body related to respiration using IoT? I repeat, uh, how uh, to get I got, data? I understood, I understood the question. See, using respiration. So, See, the respiration itself is a body, uh, means it's a process uh, where you are inhaling and you are exhaling. So, basically, the inhaling and the exhaling process, you have to make sure, uh, you, you have to keep a sensor uh, on the on the heartbeats as well as on the skin temperature, on the skin conductance, because they're, they're all correlated. So, you, you have already uh, a, a system where how your respiratory system is going to work for you. Already you might have seen in the COVID-19, of course. Uh, so, basically, you can have a camera. So, uh, in the camera, uh, actually, the uh, pose estimations, what I told you, the, uh, if you see uh, the Google, if you see the case studies of Google, the Google uh, now the, using TensorFlow only, the X-rays have been scanned. And if you put a camera, automatically what is there inside your uh, uh, body, the chest X-ray, the chest X-ray is what I'm talking about. It has already been scanned and it has been already analyzed. So if you look to the Google's website, you'll get the complete case study. So for that, a sensor itself is not required, only a camera. Uh, that is a webcam is a, enough for, for them to scan your chest and uh, apply your machine learning model. So that is the level at which your Google has proceeded, please. Uh, you can just uh, look to the Google case studies on the TensorFlow, you'll see that application. Oh, another question in the chat box, sir. Will you talk a bit about your book on IoT and COVID-19? Can you discuss some few applicants, applications? Yeah, yeah, see, yeah. basically the IoT on COVID-19, uh, the book uh, emphasizes on how IoT is going to be useful. So basically we discussed about Internet of Medical Things, IOMT. So this IOMT, basically where you, how you are going to collect the data from the COVID patients and how your uh, systems are working uh, once the data has been collected, what are the data logistics for that one? Means uh, uh, the data collection without, because the social distancing, uh, the important things are social distancing and uh, um, a, 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 of course, the safeguarding of yourself, uh, not to go for the uh, places and how people, whether people are gathering the, there and what are the systems which are, are trying to monitor, whether you are having a face mask or not, whether there is a social distancing is followed in the uh, buses as well as in the community places, as well as uh, how your IO MT is useful for collecting the COVID patients, uh, the uh, clinical data and how the nurses are guiding them. So all these aspects uh, we have discussed, ma'am, the systems are there. So uh, you can please refer to that book. Uh, if you have any further doubts, I'll definitely explain to you. Of course, the programming wise, it is not there. It is an application oriented as well as a system approach, the system approach. And uh, of course, there are a few case studies with the programming is also given, but not majority of them. So definitely I can help you in if you are uh, going to further explore more on this one. So I just, just uh, briefed you about what is that contains and all. Yeah. Sir, capturing the image using the camera, how to compare the images with using tensor for which learning is suitable? Perfectly, all right. Yesterday, I think, uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, did you present for the yesterday's demo, I means the practice session in the afternoon? We have captured an image using the Pi camera. Sorry. One minute, sir, I am unmuting uh, the person. Ah, yeah, just to have a discussion, sir, that's it. So, Ganesh, sir, uh, I request you to unmute and you can. Uh, uh, if you cannot uh, have an audio problem, you can as well as type, sir. Just I want to make sure that if you have seen that yesterday's demo, so once you capture the picture, so if you want to give that picture as an input to the existing TensorFlow system, you can just give that whatever yesterday we have shown that as a video, we have shown it. So you have the mobile net, you have the RAS net, you have the YOLO, you have the SSD. There are various already models are there. So what are the objects available on that figure? It can easily uh, classify as well as you still detect. Multiple objects can be easily, yes, sir. Yeah, you, you attend your no, sir, yes. So the once you got the picture, you give the picture as an input to your uh, learn model, the mobile net or your uh, res, res net or your another VCC net or whatever the models you are there, you just give that as an input. It will tell you what is been present in that model. It will, of course, the accuracy, if you want to increase the accuracy, then you please collect the, uh, 
okay since the uh, anyway i'll just take another 5 minutes time of your participants please hold on so i'll just uh, uh, can you see my screen uh, sinwa sir yes sir yeah. so uh, all of you please look to this particular website google teachable machine so this teachable machine is there here those who cannot write a single line of program or those who are having difficulty in writing programs you need not worry about that you can use this google teachable machine so i let show you just 5 5 minutes demo for you so this teachable machine will take pictures like what you are asking how do you classify and all so this is a small demo for you here so i am taking an image project you can take as well as audio project and the pose nets are also there so here i am using the webcam okay i think zoom is connected let me just stop from the zoom i will yeah are you able to see my screen uh, sinwa sir yes sir teachable machine yes sir. yeah so yeah. now am i visible on the teachable machines camera yes, yes sir right see i am now uh, how to make the machine learn so i am giving a small example i am giving one object here this is a, a, a camera so i am just taking the pictures of the camera here please if you see on the right side i am giving all the pictures some samples of the images 70 80 100 so the more the images the more clarity you will get the outputs in the later stages so of course i am giving here 150 images of this camera then uh, suppose this is a, a mouse oh, okay let me first i need to give a label for this this is basically uh, mobile camera i am just giving a name this is a labeling this is basically supervised learning that's what the supervised learning is so mobile i already have given a mobile here now i am collecting another class of means another object here so another object is i am collecting here the another object so you can see the mouse is there i am just collecting the data of this mouse pictures along with me of course i you can eliminate me actually when you are doing it so some certain samples i am collecting here 150 samples something like this and i give this as uh, the class label the label of this class is basically your mouse so okay you can give like this n number of objects so for you to just understand i am giving two objects here now what i do i just click the train model so i have given two objects here one object is the camera another object is mouse and i click the next step is train model so it is preparing the training so you need not write the program actually your google is doing this particular training process for you so it will just take little bit of time here uh, just can you hold on for uh, just two minutes depending on the internet speed uh, this uh, uh, training will take place at a certain time so it is getting trained just hold on for a certain one minute of time at least so the training process is happening with two objects here so once the training is completed now you can see of course you can export this export this model and this is what your tensor flow and you can put it this model on your mobile phone or on your raspberry pi or on your microcontroller or whatever it may be so now i give the object here so you can see that object what i'm giving it is showing 100% this is a mouse so there is no mobile value there this is the object which i am showing is a mouse it is detected this the object is detected here similarly now i am giving a camera now you see the mobile oh, sorry uh, camera means the mobile so mobile it is giving almost a 70% so it is not accurate because my face is also been considered it is showing the different set of values but most of the time around 50 to 70% it is showing the mobile itself here so the 70% of the time mobile so this how your object class your detection and the recognitions you can perform it so once you see that preview is done you can go to the export model now you can go to the tensorflow you want to export it as a tensorflow.js or you want to export it as a tensorflow lite or you want to put it in the tensorflow its so that you can train it more with the other set of values google has given you it freely so without writing a single line of code you are doing you are training your machine learning model with different objects here so like this you can train it and you can prepare your own model and you can run it and test it and you can play with this and you can show it to your students and explore more things so you can rewrite you can do a transfer learning in the later stages 
so on and so forth. So many things can be done here. Is the training happening in the cloud or on local? It is happening in the cloud, actually. Zamir Basha, if the training is happening in the cloud, if you want to have it on your local computer, the yesterday's process is uh, what we have to do. If you want to have your own on your system, you don't want to put it on the cloud. Yeah. Any other doubts, please? Okay, I have taken a lot of time. Don't worry, because the next session is to start. You need to take a break. So anyway, I will be there in the afternoon. You can discuss it further. Uh, so just uh, Sinvasan, yes, let us complete the session now. You need to start the another session now. Yes, sir. I am starting the feedback form, sir. Yeah, yeah, please collect it and uh, uh, we'll meet in the afternoon session. Yeah. Kindly uh, bear with me for the afternoon session. We'll have a practice only. Thank you. So participants are requested to give their feedback for this session.